said, I'm Dr. Susan Daniel, and I practice um, with three other optometrists and about 20 employees in Carlsbad, California. And this is the cutest picture I could put up here because it's my son, Matthew, um, when he was um, just a year old. And you can see he wears glasses. Um, and so this lecture is kind of near and dear to my heart, and I had a lot of fun putting it together. Um, we discovered that um, my son had poor vision um, very early on. He had glasses when he was five months old. And uh, so I'm going to tell you a little bit about our journey and um, uh, how we helped him develop his vision. So. So this is me as a baby. <laughs> and so if you can tell, I have my mouth wide open because I love to talk back then as well as now. And I thought it would be appropriate for you guys to see me um, at my true state starting at birth. Um, as Dinah said, I've been in practice for a while and um, president of NORA. Um, I'm also a teacher. Um, I teach uh, fourth year optometry students at our practice um, who are going through their rotation to learn about vision development, um, both for uh, neurotypical children and children with special needs, as well as um, adults with uh, brain injury and stroke. Um, I work with uh, two hospitals in their brain injury rehab departments and also a consultant um, for vision therapy services and provider for all of the San Diego County school districts. So one of the um, opportunities that are out there to get your child um, vision tested is through the infancy program. And it's about um, seven to 8,000 uh, optometrists to volunteer their time to provide uh, babies six months to a year old with a full comprehensive eye exam. And so far it, during the program, there's been over 150,000 exams provided and about 18,000 of those um, the doctors have found vision conditions that needed to be treated. Um, so I would encourage you guys to take advantage of this program. We are one of the providers of infancy and I love seeing the babies as well as Dr. Dukes and uh, we would welcome you to come. So this is uh, my first child, Rachel. Uh, she's now 26, um, but she had beautiful eyes back then and she still has beautiful eyes now. You get to see pictures of all my children as we go along. Um, so what is tested during an infant evaluation um, and how do we test for that? So these are the things that we're gonna go over in my uh, lecture. Um, we test visual acuity, which is the clarity of sight. Um, refractive error, which is whether you're nearsighted, farsighted, have astigmatism, um, and the ocular motor skills, which is the ability to um, fixate and follow um, a target and being able to jump fixate from one target to another visually. Binocular vision, um, which is a, a word that describes how the two eyes will coordinate together as a team to make one percept. Uh, amblyopia, which is a drew case in vi vision, even with the prescription, um, where the brain hasn't developed one eye. Um, and ocular health, and I'll go over some conditions that um, we uh, test for during an infant exam. So the first thing that uh, people asked me when they saw um, my little baby with glasses is um, random people would come up to me and say, how did you know that your child need glasses and how in the world did they test to find out what the prescription was? Um, and I was like, well, lucky for him, I'm an eye doctor. And even to me, it was a surprise. I just one day um, looked at his eyes uh, and I found uh, that he had a very high prescription. And then it made sense um, why he wasn't responding to uh, faces the way I was expecting to and um, to his mobile and different pictures um, because he couldn't see. Um, so how we check for refractive error is that we have a special type of light that um, we shine the light um, through the patient's eyes, through their pupil, and we look at the reflex that bounces back um, off of the back of the eye. And if the um, movement of the light and the reflex go in the same direction, we add a magnification lens in front of them. If it goes in the opposite direction, we add a minification lens. And when the movement of the light, when we move it and the reflex doesn't move, that means that we have their prescription. So a child 
child doesn't need to um, be able to speak at all in order for us to find an accurate prescription for, um, for glasses if necessary. So how we check for visual acuity is um, a little different too. Um, there's a uh, many research studies that showed that um, babies will always prefer to see something that is more visually interesting than a blank space. And so there is a type of visual acuity cards um, called teller acuity cards. And you can see they have different gradings of um, lines. And when we show this um, card in front of the baby's eyes, what we're looking for as the examiner is where the baby is looking. Do they look right towards the stripes or do they just not really look um, either direction? Um, if they look towards the stripes, then they know that they're able to see that size of, um, of grading. And then we um, turn it around and we have them look to see if they're looking at the stripes too when it's in the other direction. And then we make the grading smaller and smaller and smaller until they can't tell the difference between um, uh, one side or the other. And then we know that the one that they could see was um, what their visual acuity is. Now, many people don't know that um, babies are not born with 20-20 vision. Um, they have very blurry vision and that it develops. So vision is a visual skill that is developed over time. And from visual acuity to um, all of these visual skills that we're gonna be going through. One of the popular um, vis uh, visual acuity tests that we use is called the Keeler-Cardiff acuity test. And you can see it, it looks a little different than the one with gradings. Um, instead of the baby having to look side to side to look at a grading, they look at a picture, either up or down. And looking up or down is a little easier for the examiner to tell whether they see it or not. And because it's more of a visually interesting um, picture, uh, the baby will, uh, look towards the picture. Now it has the same um, type of grading where the lines of the picture get smaller and smaller and smaller as far as um, more fine. And when the baby can't tell um, what, that there's a picture there um, and they're just looking all around, then that's when we know what their visual acuity is. This test is also very helpful um, for children with special needs who um, are not reliable to um, be able to see a letters on a chart, um, but they um, are interested in pictures. And this one was um, excellent for determining the visual acuity for my son because it was more interesting to him than the gradings. So one of the first visual skills that we look at is a visual pursuit. And a visual pursuit is the ability to fixate on a target, like a toy, and be able to follow it with your eyes in all different gazes. Um, now, what is normal is that a baby first learns to just fixate, um, be able to find the target and just keep their eyes on it. Um, that usually starts with a parent's face um, because a parent is usually the one that is uh, changing their diaper and feeding them and um, making googly eyes at them and getting their expressions. And so that's when they first learn to fixate. Then to be able to follow is a learned skill. Um, and at first they move more of their whole body to follow. Then as they develop a little older, then they move their head to follow. And then um, by the age of five, they start to have their head and body still to where now they can follow the, the target with just their eyes without their head and body moving. And so what we're looking for in the examination um, is how accurate are their visual um, pursuits and are their eyes um, uh, moving at the same rate, um, whether and that one eye isn't doing all the fixating and following and the other one just kind of following. So the other type of uh, visual oculomotor skill is called a saccade. And a saccade is the ability to fixate on one target and then be able to notice that there's another target out in the periphery and then look at that target. So it's a different part of the brain that controls um, a visual saccade than a visual pursuit. And so what we want to see is, are they able to notice things in the periphery and change their attention to that? Um, and that's also a skill that is developed. And this one is um, very important as 
for reading later on in their, um, their childhood development. And if they are not able to jump fixate across their body um, uh, accurately and quickly, then it makes it very di difficult to read words along the page. So we start to develop these as early as a few months old. One of the other type of eye movements that we look at is uh, what's called nystagmus. And nystagmus is a fancy word that means that um, the eyes are moving involuntarily to where they have a beat to where they, they move. Um, and it's when you have a, a beat to it, there's um, a few reasons why they can have this involuntary movement. Um, they can uh, have ocular albinism, which means that they have no pigment on the inside of the eye. So the vision it has, isn't able to develop as well. And so the eyes will shake. Uh, they can be born with the eye shaking. They can also have a very high prescription, so they can't see well, so their eyes start to shake. Um, or they have um, some deficit in their brain that is causing the eyes to shift. And um, the binocular vision uh, starts to be intact by about six months old. Um, Sometimes when they're younger than that, the eyes may wander where one eye fixates and the other one doesn't quite come together because they haven't developed control of their head yet. And as they get more control of where their head is, then the eyes start to be able to work more conjugate together. Um, and it's why six months old is the perfect time to have your baby's eyes checked um, because that is where these um, visual skills should um, be starting to be developed. Um, how we check for uh, the two eyes coordinating together as a team is looking at um, having them look at a toy, covering and uncovering their eyes, and we see how the eyes move, and we can tell if one eye is turning in or out or up or down. We can use prisms and lenses to see how much stress on their visual system can they take before one eye doesn't want to work. Um, and it's all measurable as well as we can do as an adult, just in a different way. So this is a picture of a child that has an eye turn, um, and it's an obvious eye turn in that um, everybody that looks at um, this child will know that they have an eye turn. Um, but some eye turns are look like they are the eyes are straight, and they still might have just a little eye turn. And that little to eye turn can cause as much um, uh, difficulty in developing the turned eye as one that has a big one. And so um, if this child had um, come to their pediatrician, the pediatrician would know automatically to send them to an eye doctor. Um, but if they had a, a minor or a little degree of an eye turn, they may not notice. And so that's another good reason to have them checked. Now, amblyopia I mentioned is um, where the eye doesn't, the eye that's either turned um, or has a different prescription that is widely different than the other eye. Um, that eye will, the brain sees poorly out of it, so it shuts it off or suppresses that image. And so then that eye doesn't develop as well as the other eye. So one eye fixates, this one turns, the brain shuts this one off so that this one does all the work and this eye doesn't develop as well. And that is treated um, by different types of um, glasses, even contact lenses, um, if they have a high prescription, um, prescription eye drops, um, visual therapy, and even types of glasses that have some types of occlusion that teaches the eyes to work better together as a team. And we treat those um, that way before we um, even consider surgery, uh, because surgery can align the eyes, um, but not necessarily help in the development of the poorer eye. There are many ways that we check the internal eye health of the eye. Um, one of the ways is that we um, look through the pupil of the child using a magnifying lens and a light, and we can see the internal structures of the eyes. We can look at the nerve and the retina, all the blood vessels to make sure that the eyeball itself is healthy. Um, we also have an instrument that takes a photograph of the back of the eye. And, um, and we can even do this on babies too. It's like we hold 
told him like, um, we're gonna do an airplane activity and we bring him up to the instrument and take the picture. And um, that is a good way to um, follow them throughout their life to see um, if there's any changes um, in their, the health of their eye. And one of the reasons why we check that um, is a, a very rare condition. Um, it's called retinoblastoma, and it's a type of eye cancer that is in babies. And um, you'll see when you're looking at the pupil of, the, of this child's right eye that it is cloudy, um, whereas in the left eye, it has that normal red reflex that you get when you're shining a light into a, um, a child's eyes. And so if you ever see um, a child, um, a baby, or a young child um, that has one pupil that is very different than the other, then definitely get them referred to an eye doctor just to rule this out. Because the earlier you can pick this up, the easier it is to treat. Um, one of the other conditions, and this is usually checked right at birth, um, is to see if the child has cataracts. And cataracts is an opacity of the lens that's on the inside of the eye. Um, now, we normally associate cataracts with um, people who um, are older than 60, and, but they can be in children as well. And it's often from a traumatic birth and uh, that they had difficulty in birth, especially if they were um, taken out of the birth canal um, by forceps, then that can cause uh, a cataract. Now these cataracts, um, prevent that eye from developing because it doesn't see as well as the, the other eye. And so they need to be removed right away. Um, and the earlier that they are removed and replaced with a, uh, a lens, the um, better the outcome of that, uh, that child's vision. And then there's glaucoma. And glaucoma is a, um, a silent uh, disorder. And why I say silent is because it doesn't have um, pain or blurry vision or anything noticeable. And these are for adults um, until uh, the progression of this disease has progressed a ways and then you lose vision and because it doesn't have any symptoms. But in a child, they're not going to complain of any symptoms anyway. So what we, um, what we look at is glaucoma is where the pressure in the eye gets too high. And there's, there's an eye pressure, just like there's a blood pressure. And when the eye pressure gets too high, then it can damage the nerve on the inside of the eye and cause poor vision. And so with this child, you'll notice that the right eye looks a little different than the left eye, that it's kind of bulging forward. And with babies, because they're still kind of pliable, the, when the pressure gets high, the eye kind of bulges. So if you notice any difference between the two eyes or a bulging of the eye, then that's good to have it checked. So um, these are some of the statistics that go over why children's vision needs to be checked as an infant, uh, because one out of 10, that's a lot, one out of 10 are at risk for an undiagnosed vision problem, and one in 25 will develop strabismus, which is the eye turn, um, and out of those, one in 30 will develop a lazy eye. And one in 33 will have um, a significant refractive error where they need glasses. And one in 100 will have a disease and one in 20,000 will have um, eye cancer. But overall too, the vision disorders are the fourth most common disability in the United States and the most prevalent handicapped condition during childhood. And this is my daughter, Elena, my youngest daughter. She is now 19. <laughs> I have cute kids. <laughs> so um, birth to three months, these are some of the things that we look for. Um, so signs that as a, a provider, a parent, a therapist, a teacher, anybody who is watching, um, uh, take caring of a baby, these are things to look out for by the end of the third month. Um, you want to um, see if the child is, has a failure to recognize food when it is brought, um, because usually by uh, about uh, a month, um, they notice where their milk source is coming from, whether it's mom or a bottle, and they can recognize that it's coming. Um, and if they have the failure to do that and they're just like, oh, there's, there's my bottle, <laughs> then that's something to um, be concerned about. <laughs> 
Um, they should start to have that eye contact in, um, by three months and be able to, to notice you when you get close to them. Um, you want to look to see if there's a, an eye that's constantly turned, um, like that baby that we saw with the eye turn in. Um, remember I was saying it, it's kind of normal for some of the eyes not to coordinate too well together until six months, but if you see one eye that's always out, or up or down or in, um, then that's something that they need to check earlier um, than six months. And we talked about the pupils that if they don't seem right, then get it checked. And um, you want the baby to be able to follow you in all different directions with their eyes. Um, sometimes there's uh, eye problems where the nerve innervating the muscle of uh, one of the, the muscles isn't working well. And so the eyes will um, not be able to track in certain fields of gaze. And um, that's best treated as an early baby. Um, and if you have mucus in either eye um, that causes their eyelids to be shut, um, it can be one of a few conditions. Um, some of the more popular, they can have an eye infection or they can have a, a tear duct that may be closed. And so the tears can't um, drain and uh, it can cause a buildup of mucus in their eyes. And then that can be treated as well. So the things that you can do um, in the first three months to help vision development is, um, and Dinah mentioned this a little bit, is that you want to change the position of the crib um, or the baby within the crib um, so that their vision, they have something different to look at when they're looking um, through the rails of the crib. So one of the things if you, always put them down to bed um, in the same direction and the bed never changes, then they have nothing new to look at. Um, but if you set them down on the right side and then the, the next time they sleep, set them on the left side and then forward, um, or you move the crib into different parts of the room, um, that makes it a lot more visually interesting for them. Um, you want to have a chance to see moving patterns like in a mobile. Um, and you want the, uh, the pictures to be high contrast. Um, now, a lot of really beautiful mobiles are pastel, but that's not the best for visual development. Um, you want them to have high contrast, like red and black and white, ones that have faces, ones that have patterns, um, and they have mobiles that look like that. Um, you want to speak to your baby no matter where in the room that you are. And, um, and the reason for that is that um, the baby needs to um, have experience and learn how to visually locate where sound is coming from. So you want to continually talk to your baby as you're moving around the room, you know, cleaning the room, um, putting things away uh, to where you're not always right in front of them, but you're in different parts of the room talking to them so that they can try to locate um, where they are. And with the, uh, what's normal for um, a baby uh, up to three months is that they can see up to about um, eight uh, inches away uh, from, from themselves. And you can see that's kind of where you're feeding them too. And so that's a really good time to get their eye contact, um, to make faces to them, to get um, that comforting feel because that's where their vision is developed at this age. Um, and you want to um, uh, follow, have them follow to the left, to the right, and up and down, and just keep moving around when you're um, getting your baby's attention. Um, and fun rattles. Now, rattles are great for babies because um, they tell the baby where their body is in space. Um, as they shake the, the rattles, they're going, oh, that's where my arm is. I didn't know that was me that could do that. And when they bop themselves in the head, they're like, oh, I did that. Um, the other thing is that um, as they're looking at the rattle and pushing it away, that's developing their focusing system. Um, the ability to change focus from near to far starts with rattles. And it's not just hands, it's uh, rattles on their feet as well. It's like, where are my feet? So here's some pictures of um, some cute little rattles that can go on socks and on their hand, a mobile that has a high contrast and um, some pictures that you can um, put on uh, the edge of the crib and change the pictures around as well as on their changing table or um, by their bath, you know, uh, pictures along their, um, uh, the bathtub that they have. 
Um, and then we have these um, infant visual stimulation patterns that you can um, download and print and just put them all over the house, <laughs> you know, and so they have something that's different to look at, switch them around, um, and there's a whole set, set of those. So from four to eight months, these are some of the signs that you can look for. Um, that you want to um, see if you're concerned about it. And by this time, we want to make sure that the eyes are working together all of the time. Um, and that um, it's not just the intermittently work, working together as a team. Um, you want them to be able to pick up eye contact and show interest in the things at a distance now of two to three feet. Not I mean, before it was around eight inches, but now their vision should develop acuity wise to see things out to two to three feet. And that's where things are when they're learning to crawl that you want to hold, put things that are out within that distance for them to try to get to and grab and to explore um, why they're on their tummy. Um, you want them to have the opportunities to inspect um, things that are different sizes and textures um, in the environment. But if they don't, um, aren't interested and um, just not really exploring with us, then that's uh, a concern that their vision might be poor. Um, and you want to see um, when you uh, approach them or they have your favorite toy that they just light up. And that means that they're fixating and recognize it and they get excited about that. So these are some things that you can do to help your babies develop. Um, so one of the things that um, you can do, you want to make sure is that they have tummy time. Now the pediatrician will tell you this too, um, because they realize also how important it is for their gross motor development and their visual development. And so you want to um, have them on their belly so that they have to lift their head up and reach for things um, and inspect them. And you don't want everything to be right in front of them, but things that are off to the side. So they have to move their body side to side to try to grab and reach, reach these things and maybe even a little bit outside of their reach so they have to kind of maneuver to get outside of the reach until they get to crawling and then you move things out a little bit further. Um, you want a little jungle gym where they're laying down and playing with things that are up in front that are interesting, that have different textures, different sounds, um, different shapes and sizes, um, and the, uh, the same with their toys. Um, and you want to try hiding some objects um, where part of their toy is covered like with a blanket to see if they recognize that that's still the same toy if they don't see the whole thing. And, um, and that um, helps develop, um, we call it, constancy where um, like when my mom leaves and I can still hear her, is she still there um, because I can't see her? Those are skills that are learned. And so it starts with doing that with their toys. Um, An object permanence as well. Start naming all of their toys and the things that you're doing and the food and the, in, when you're in the car, what they're seeing. Um, because their receptive language, um, it develops before their expressive language. And what that means is that they're starting to understand what you're saying and being able to attach a word to uh, an object way before they're able to say ball or mom or dad <laughs> or, you know, the dog. Those are kind of the common words that are first words. But they knew that that was a dog because you kept saying dog um, and, uh, or ball. And so you want to start naming things. Um, you want to have... Uh, uh, like an area where they can, uh, when they're getting to crawling, is to be able to go over things and under things, through tubes, through um, around um, things so that they are figuring out how to use their vision to guide their body um, around and over and under things. And, um, and one of the, the things is that the, one of the most interesting things that they can fixate on is their own face. And so um, having a toy that has a mirror on it or you're like you're in a car seat and they have a mirror to look at themselves and they can make funny faces and um, be able to um, uh, explore not only their face but um, see how different the distinct um, features are of their face. So here are some cool toys that are appropriate for this age group. Um, they have uh, balls that have um, little uh, 
uh, spikes on it that have different textures. Some of them are easy to squeeze. Some of them are harder to squeeze, easier to roll on, but they give a feedback on their hands that, ooh, this is a ball and it has texture. Um, and you've seen probably a lot of these types of toys in the second picture that have um, different types of fabric. Um, the same thing with the bean bag, uh, something soft and something silky and something rough and like sandpaper. And um, all of that gives the, the hands start to feel what the textures are. And then later, as they have all that experience with touching it and mouthing it and feeling those textures, then that develops into where I can just look at that and know that's a silky one and that one is a scratchy one and being able to identify things just visually without having to touch it. But you have to go through that touching stage first. This is a picture of uh, one of the mirrors and a jungle gym and even some squishy blocks that they can work on um, just stacking up and watching them fall down. Um, that uh, highly entertaining, but great for their vision. Um, so the picture on the left, I didn't get a great picture of this, but it's of a child um, using like a, a roller that has balls in it. And as they're trying to catch this rolling thing, it keeps moving further. So it helps improve their visual motor and their ability to crawl to try to um, keep uh, track of this object. Um, and then they have these mats that have um, uh, water uh, or fluid in them with um, different feel of objects in there that they can lay on and feel and press and move the water and see how kind of a cause and effect um, a toy that works their, um, their visual system quite well. So from nine to 18 months. Um, so these are some of the signs to look out for. So um, if the baby is interested in exploring size and shape and depth and um, the inside of containers, if you um, don't see that, um, then that's a concern. Um, if they, uh, the baby is able to move outside of the eyesight to have you and still explore, then that's good. Um, if uh, he visually judges the size of his body so that he doesn't continually bump his head on uh, or as he's crawling under thing or judging width that he's not trying to get into something too, uh, that is small, that means he hasn't had enough experience in figuring out where their body is in space. Um, this was my son who had, you know, visual delays is that he would run into things and he'd go and touch it again, you know, it's like, oh, where'd that happen? Where'd that happen? And he had to do it over and over before he figured out, okay, I need to duck to go underneath this so I don't hit my head. So he had a lot of difficulty with his visual perception and being able to judge um, size and depth and width and height. Um, but through a lot of experience and giving him those opportunities that are safe, then he was able to develop that normally. Um, other things to watch out um, is um, you want to see as they're learning to use um, large crayons that are like an egg, and I'll show you a picture of it, and they're making marks on a paper. Um, do their eyes kind of guide where their hands are looking, or are they just looking off to the side? You want to um, get the starting to learn to be able to look and touch simultaneously. Um, do they... Uh, look through and put like sand in containers and objects in containers. And um, this is also the time that they're starting to play alongside other children um, and doing some what we call parallel play where they're interested in their own things, but they're next to each other. And then imitation or interactive play where one um, child does one thing and the other one goes, oh, that's interesting. I'll do the same thing. Um, so those are the, some of the things that uh, happen during this age group. So some of the things that you can do to, um, to develop their vision is um, work on crawling. Um, like I said, under and over, um, around things. And you want the crawling to um, be um, predominant in those early months because if they don't get enough crawling um, at a young age, you know, between um, six to 18 months, then um, that they don't get that bilateral movement of their body, which um, is necessary for the binocular, the two eyes working together as a team. And so, you know, uh, when my daughter, my youngest daughter, she wanted to like walk at, you know, nine months old and I kept putting her on the floor, <laughs> you know, because it was really important to have her do more crawling before she gets up to walking and um, in order to develop those skills so that she'll be um, 
able to use their eyes better and be a better reader later on. Um, you want to have um, things that they like to put things in containers. And this can be um, not uh, toys, but just uh, Tupperware and um, with just objects like spoons and stuff that you're putting into Tupperware, but where you're putting things in and out and dumping things out and putting things in and seeing that cause and effect. And um, the other thing is that you want to have opportunities to judge distances. Um, and this is where the kids, you know, they um, pick up and they, they drop things off of their high chair. And then they look for it and then you pick it up and you put it back and then they drop it again. <laughs> well, they're, what they're doing is seeing not just cause and effect or to try to bug you, but they're trying to figure out how long and how far things are from where they are. And, um, and we talked about um, providing opportunities now to play things that are a little bit further away, two to four feet. Um, you want the um, baby to uh, the child, young child to be able to start to look for things and find them around corners or into a different room, rather than just have everything right in front of them. So, you know, we play, it's like a little hide and go seek with their favorite toy. It's like, where can I hide it? And can they search and find it? Um, those are good activities to do. Uh, Peekaboo, uh, seeing the Jack in the Box, all uh, those are great. And so here are some of the toys that we use. Um, the stacking cups, this is the thing where they can stack them up and, and learning size and shape um, and color, and then be able to knock them down and then stack them up again, not just on top, but within. Um, a little Jack in the Box. And one of my favorite toys that we have in our clinic is the one in the center um, that works on visual tracking. Um, the ability to see this little car go down um, the ways it's very interesting <laughs> and it keeps their attention to follow this target um, and to see um, where that that little car goes and these are the type of crayons that this age should um, be using it's one where they're getting um, a grasping um, uh, type of holding uh, a crayon. And then later it'll get to when they're using more of a pincher to get that three point um, used to hold a pen like we do now. Um, and this is the age that we start doing shapes and putting shapes within um, their forms and seeing that they're how to line them up and getting some direction of things. Um, finger painting, um, doing uh, different exploring through like sand or um, rice or beans where you're putting different objects where they have to find, um, find the objects within it. Anything that's working with the hands and being able to look and explore is great. Um, and we talked about parallel play as well as climbing over things. Um, I like this upper, um, on the upper left side, the toy is a really cool toy in that um, they, it has rub, um, like these rubber bands and they have to figure out how much pressure it takes to put the object within the band and then how to figure out how to get the objects to come out of the box. And so it's a great exploration of using their hands, feeling different pressures and um, being able to um, coordinate their vision with their motor. And like these little um, gems, like on the top right with the slide, it gives opportunities for them to go through the holes and up to the top and slide down and climb um, in uh, what's appropriate for that age. But even a simple box that you get, um, you know, a packing box, kids just love um, because they're figuring out how to climb in, how to put it on their head, um, going through the box. And um, it's all exploring kind of where I'm in space and that size, you know, that judging of depth and size. And this last toy is one that's like a stacking toy too to see how do I get them to stack up without them falling down and then to make them fall down again. Um, and it's even for a little older kids too because it has like a fishing magnet that you can um, uh, look at depth and trying to um, pick up the, the fish with the magnet on the end of the string. So this is my daughter, Liz. She's my oldest daughter and she's now 27. She's a cutie. <laughs> So now 18 to months to three years. And we're looking forward to see if the child can walk and um, 
and maneuver around um, steps and curves and familiar territory. Um, they're starting to use Legos and building things um, and more towers and more uh, smaller objects. Um, they have not too small to choke, but small enough to where they have to maneuver their fingers more. And can they cross the midline of their body? Um, now, many of you may not have heard, what is she talking about? Um, Crossing midline is a, a skill that's really important in the early development years, and it starts right around age two. Um, up until then, a child will pick up a toy on the right side and bring it to their middle and then put it down on their left side because they're not picking it up and crossing over their body midline. Um, or they pick it up and then move their whole body to put it over on that side. So they're still not crossing midline. But right around um, this H grain is when they're learning to pick it up and cross midline. And it's important to be able to cross midline both from the right to the left and the left to the right, um, because if you don't have that ability to cross midline on your body, then it's hard for the eyes to cross midline visually um, in tracking and also in eye jumping. And so this is a skill that's really necessary for early reading. And we have a lot of children in our practice that um, are not able to cross midline and they could be 12, 15 years old, and it's prevented them from uh, progressing in their academics. And so one of the things that you can do is um, provide those opportunities where you put puzzle pieces on the one side of them and the puzzle on the other side. And instead of you know having them uh, move their body, uh, sit behind them so that they are supported to where then they have to cross their midline and then you switch it around. Um, they'll probably wonder what you're doing, but it's good for them to be able to reach across midline. And then we want to see if um, they can find hidden objects and be able to understand a simple set of spatial directions, such as um, uh, can you put that on top of the table or um, that's around the corner. Those kinds of things um, should be starting right about by 18 months. And so um, you want to see, are they thinking before they're doing their actions? Because by then, by now, they're starting to have some experience, just like, you know, always talking about touching something hot and then you're like, oh, it's hot. I don't want to do that again. Um, it's like other things that are visual that they can um, know exactly how this toy is going to run because they've had experience for it before. Um, you want to be able to, uh, for them to understand, can you pick up the uh, scratchy bean bag that they've attached now the word to the, the texture. And um, now they're being able to see better out to eight feet. And so that's where their visual world is within eight feet. Um, so here's some things to do. You're, this is the age where you bring him to the park and you do all of those um, climbing and swinging and sliding and uh, stomping and playing in puddles and going across bridges and um, playing with uh, balloons or beach balls, um, kicking them. Uh, all of those, this is the, the really fun playtime. And so um, as we talked, we're just gonna be doing all of the things. You want to also read books to them and have them point out the differences um, between the objects, you know, what's big and what's small. And you, you ask these questions about it to where they're getting the experience that there's differences in um, size and shape and color and people. And, um, and then one of the things that is great for this age is to provide them with a chalkboard or an easel that has a chalkboard um, because before you get them sitting and using their crayons um, you want to get them to where they're standing and using their whole arm and their body to do their pictures um, to where they can cross their midline um, they can do full extension um, because it starts with uh, feeling where my arm is in space before you get to where your wrist is and your hand and so if you skip this part then it gets their handwriting is much uh, affected later on um, and then we can work on crossing midline, like making big circles and making crossing the body to make long um, lines. And, um, and the chalk um, is great because it gives a, a response back, a feedback to them that they're making a mark. 
um, more than just a whiteboard um, because a whiteboard is so smooth it doesn't give that feedback. Nice. Um, using chalk on a driveway is great as well, you know, where you have a, a big space to make big lines with your body. Um, and playing dress up. Um, again, it's the textures and visual motor integration where you're, you're looking and uh, trying to put uh, the clothes on, put a hat on and using your eyes to guide um, your motor tasks. And here's some um, pictures of some toys that um, are useful for this age. Um, in the upper left, these, it's, uh, it's like a matching game um, to where the little pegs have um, fabric in them that are different textures. And then you have to feel that texture, feel the texture in the circle and then match it to it. Um, you can do a lot of balloon games. And the reason why we do balloons at this, at this age is because the balloons travel slowly. Um, if you're just throwing them a ball, um, they don't have the motor and the visual coordination yet to um, just throw it when you have different velocities um, of speed, you know, when they're coming in. And that depth perception, that quickness of depth perception hasn't developed so much at this age. So you start with a slow, slower target, which is a balloon. You can hit them, you can tap them, um, you can blow bubbles. All of those things are really helpful. Um, and we talked about building Legos and also this domino game with textures is really cool that you're matching um, same um, uh, shapes and texture and color. Um, so you're working with uh, all different manipulatives and puzzles. And this little girl on the bottom right, um, we're working on crossing that motor midline um, at this age. And here's the, the sand games and the dressing up and uh, the kicking the ball. But with the, um, the lower right, um, these are great toys because you have to take one object and another and put the screws in. You have to connect things. So it's using the two hands together and guiding um, with their eyes to try to hook it together. That visual motor integration is great with this. Um, this is one when you have... Um, uh, different pieces of uh, fruit and vegetables, you know, and they, they're either wood or plastic with Velcro on them. And you um, spread them all out uh, um, amongst the floor or the room or the table, because you can go out to eight feet now um, to where they have to look and find where's all the pieces of the pineapple. And then being able to put them all together um, is great. And that's uh, kind of what we call a visual closure is being able to see parts of it and be able to put it together in your head. Um, this is time to do lacing and visual motor, um, being able to um, find motor, put things in a hole and figure out where it's coming from and um, doing matching games. And these are some great activities to do. So from three to four years, um, the, this is when children are able to start walking down the stairs um, and alternate um, with their body movements um, and being able to um, start working with toys without looking at their hands now that they can look around and figure out how things are moving. And they can hold their eye contact out to even further to 10 to 16 feet. Um, and so you want to see if um, they, are aware of different landmarks. Like when you're in the car um, and you're going um, uh, past grandma's house, do they recognize that that's grandma's house? You know, do they get excited by that? Or are you going by where the, um, the park is? And are they able to um, be aware and show excitement from that? And are they um, able to visualize um, the results of what they're going to do before they do it. And, and this is kind of a, a big jump in development to get to that point. And we do a lot of games that are matching um, different pictures and seeing what's the same and then also what's different and why is it different. So um, some of the things that you're going to do is um, after you've read a story, have them act it out. And um, so that they're visualizing what their um, what the story is about and being able to start using scissors and garden tools and hand other hand tools, um, catching and tapping and bunting. And why I said it's just, um, put on here a suspended ball is that this is one of the therapy activities we do as optometrists in uh, developmental optometry um, in that when a child is learning how to 
tell and space where a ball is coming from. Say you're throwing a, a, a beach ball or a, um, a volleyball or just a, a kid's ball, a rubber ball, they're, they can't really tell how quickly it's coming and all of a sudden it hits them in the face <laughs> or they're trapping the ball um, or they're missing the ball. And so one of the steps that you can do before you get to throwing in that ball where um, it changes is to attach the ball to a string that's hanging from the ceiling. So it, it moves in a pendulum. Now the pendulum can go back and forth to where then the child can um, estimate the speed better of where the ball is coming towards them and away. It works on their eye teaming skills and, um, and their timing skills. And instead of catching first, um, you want to work on tapping the ball away, like you're pushing away um, and then being able to alternate pushing with the right hand, pushing with the left hand, because that's that crossing midline again. Um, and then using paddles like ping pong paddles to, to play with the, um, the ball to make it in a controlled manner. And then catching the ball and playing with the other person going back and forth. And then you can take away the string and they're much more ready to um, estimate where that ball is, their eye teaming skills are now improved um, and uh, they're more successful and feel um, good about playing those sports. So um, the games that we do to tell us where our bodies in space are the angels in the snow, uh, like move your, your right hand and your left hand and then both hands together and then the legs. Uh, Simon says where you're doing a lot of right and left activities, parachute games um, where you're going under the parachute and then over and then you're turning and um, a lot of the things that they did in preschool for many years, but a lot of the preschools don't do that now. And so you have to kind of add that to their um, to their home activities. Rolling down a hill, um, both in somersaults and rolling body down is great um, to uh, to stimulate their vestibular or their balance system and developing that so that when they're using their eyes while in movement that they're coordinating together better. So here are some fun activities. The upper left um, is a picture of a kit that has the parachutes and the um, hula hoops and these things that they have to walk on um, and try to squish on so that they can look and use their feet to uh, manipulate. Um, and we always like the hungry hippo where you're playing, trying to get the hippo to get the as many of the balls in by using a visual motor um, uh, integration. And then we have um, the garden tools where they're digging and um, spooning and putting, the, you know, helping out in the garden. And the big picture is, um, is a great activity to do to get them ready for um, handwriting and that um, it has these grids that go uh, over a plate with a um, like a clothes pin that they have to pinch so it's working on that pincher um, activity and then they match the color of the pen um, of the clothes pin to the, um, the circle that has that same color. And so it's working on a few different things. It's working on um, space and location, on um, color matching and um, beginning uh, handwriting for the pincer grip. And here's some more um, activities that we, um, that we do as well that helps with this age group. Um, there's a cute um, game, uh, the snag and a bag and a rug <laughs> that has a, um, uh, that teaching, uh, looking at uh, same and differences and um, big and small and different colors and shapes. Um, parkentry blocks where we're looking at direction of these triangles, being able to um, copy different forms. Uh, I spy where it's like a figure ground where you're trying to find the dinosaur amongst a lot of other um, things. And that's important because, you know, um, probably yourself have gone to the refrigerator and looking for the ketchup and uh, can't find it, but it's right in front of you. Um, your, your sight is good but your visual perception isn't great. Um, so that's what the I spy is looking for. Um, and then matching games, being able to um, match 
uh, Pluto to Pluto and Tigger to Tigger and having a, uh, a memory game to where you have the cards to where you have to remember where they were placed. Um, so building like Legos, this is a cool one that it has um, more shapes. It's like the, the next step above Legos, um, a picture of the easels like I was talking about. But one of the games that you can do too is just using a piece of tape where you put it in the middle of the floor um, and the child has to crawl with putting the right hand across their body and then move their hand forward to the other, and then the hand forward to the other. Um, and that's working on crossing that midline again. Um, and then we put um, the, uh, the rings that you put over uh, the objects, like a ring toss. Um, there's ones that are safe for this age that are spongy. And, um, and you put these animals um, within their visual um, space that they should be at this age, um, between the eight and 12 feet. Um, but a little closer, you start it with it close and then you start moving out to where they estimating depth and distance and um, where that ring could go onto the, the shape. And then the last picture is a, a geo board. And so you can just Google geo boards. Um, they're one of my favorite uh, tools in that um, it's exploring, working on fine motor, visual fine motor using rubber bands to make shapes on pegs that are on this board. And there's many different ways that you can use these geo boards. You can, um, as a, the parent, make a, um, a, a shape, say a square, and then they have to make the same square on their geo board. Um, you can make to where um, they have it on a piece of paper, what, uh, what the, like a diamond, and they have to make a diamond on the geo board. But it works really well on that, um, trying to find space and shape sizes. So this is, um, these are our beautiful pictures of um, the children as we, us as children when we were um, uh, toddlers and of Dr. Dukes, who is right there smiling at me, uh, myself and my husband, Dr. Davis. Uh, this is Dinah, when she was so cute when she was little, and she is our, um, the head of our vision therapy department and a certified um, uh, vision therapist, and Melissa, who is um, one of our newest vision therapists. Uh, April, who is also a certified vision therapist, and look at that cute smile that she has as a baby. <laughs> and Felicia, who's been with us for 16 years, but she just moved and couldn't find a baby picture, so she just gets the adult picture. And the last thing, this is uh, my family all grown up. Um, you know, I, it's so much fun to have them as uh, babies and toddlers, and it's great to have them grow up to be adults too. So um, I just thank you for um, participating in my webinar. And if you have any questions, I'll be happy to answer them.